We'll give it just one more minute to allow people to join us. All right, well, we'll get started. I'd like to welcome everyone today on this beautiful afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kristen Motti. I am an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library in Boston, Massachusetts. We have a great conversation today with Sonia Shah and Nasima Safi. Um, before we get started though, I just wanna talk a little bit of, about a few housekeeping things before we go forward. Um, if you are in Zoom, you are on mute. Um, and we are recording this and we're live streaming it over at YouTube. So if you are watching it at YouTube, um, you can type your questions at any point during the conversation um, in the chat box. And if you're in Zoom, there's a Q&A button at the bottom. You can go ahead and type your questions in there. Toward the end of the program today, toward the end of our hour together today, um, we will get to questions. So feel free to type in um, at any point, anything that you have there. Also, um, you can purchase the book through our partner bookseller, Trident Booksellers, and that link will be available throughout the talk as well. So before we turn things over, I would like to introduce our special moderator today. Nasima Sefi is a physician, global health worker, ideas curator, and novelist, and she resides between Seattle and Morocco. And with that, Nasim, welcome. Thanks so much, Kristen, and welcome everybody. I first met Sonia Shah in Scotland in the summer of 2013 at a TED Global Conference where I was a guest curator. But I've been obsessed with her work for several years before then. We share the same wonderful agent, Charlotte Sheedy, and Charlotte had sent me Sonia's books. First, there was Crude, the Story of Oil, which was super interesting to me as a Middle Easterner who now lives in North Africa. And then Body Hunters, testing new drugs on the world's poorest patients. And that was equally fascinating as a physician who is interested in scoping out novel therapies. And then The Fever, how malaria has ruled humankind for half a million years, which is also a favorite of Bill Gates, had one of the most beautiful and memorable passages about how my personal nemesis, the mosquito, sips human blood. I then invited her to speak at a TED Med conference just before her prescient uh, work came out, uh, a fourth book called Pandemic, Tracking Contagions from Cholera to Ebola and Beyond. Now, this TED Med talk even mentions coronaviruses and the governor of New York. And my favorite uh, phrase of hers that I first heard, microbial xenophobia, check it out. And then as if my intellectual crush couldn't grow any stronger, she came out with this new book called The Next Great Migration, The Beauty and Terror of Life on the Move a subject that has even more personal resonance for me than the other four as a refugee advocate and self-described global nomad. This book has once again blown me away. And what makes Sonia one of my favorite science writers is that her work has this gorgeous way of braiding together rigorous evidence with a fresh investigational perspective, illuminating history and literary science narratives all in one. Sonia comes from Gujarati Jane stock. Her doctor parents migrated within India and she was born in New York City. Uh, she attended Oberlin College. She spent a decade in Boston where she had two boys and then spent three years in Australia with her molecular ecologist husband. Lately, she has 
settled in Baltimore. But when I think of Sonia, I think of her as always being on the move. For this book, she traveled from Hawaii to the Himalayas, refugee camps in Greece to border crossings in Tijuana and even the Panama Canal. I've personally lived in nine countries and like her, I'm addicted to the dopamine rush and the constant learning of, of being in a foreign place. In fact, I've just made my own great migration back home as of yesterday afternoon from Morocco to Seattle. So I'm wondering, Sonia, in this strange, surreal moment that you predicted when you wrote the book on pandemics of paused movement. First, how are you? <laughs> what effect has this pandemic pause in movement had on your work? And has it made you reconsider your relationship to migration? Thanks, Nassim. That's a lovely introduction. It's so nice to be here with you. I was, when, I, when I got the opportunity to do this, you're the first person I thought of. So I'm so glad you could make it. Um, but yeah, the pandemic's been, you know, it's been hard on me like it is hard on so many other people. And relatively speaking, I have it really easy. Um, but of course, there's strange echoes because I wrote a book about pandemics that came out in 2016. So watching it all unfold in real life has been um, a very eerie experience. I mean, I, I kind of predicted that a pandemic was going to happen in this way in my last book, right. but you always feel like it's not gonna happen that soon. Um, so I didn't actually think I'd live through it within a matter of a few years. You know, I thought, I thought we'd have maybe a decade or more. I mean, there's no rational reason to say that because the probabilities were all there but it still is a very eerie and of course, very sad and tragic uh, you know, trauma that we're all living through. And has it made you reconsider at all your relationship to movement? Yeah, it, I mean, it, yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, we're living in this moment of sort of maximum dread about things moving around. You know, it's like, well, there's germs moving around, there's animals moving around, there's people moving around. We don't want, we want to shut it all down. Um, and so I think this is just a time when we are very aware of the disruptiveness of movement. And that's really been, you know, a, the, the topic of my work for many years. Mm -hmm. In a way, you could look at, you know, malaria and in, emerging infections, cholera, like all these contagions I've been writing about all these years are about these intersections, these collisions between microbes moving, animals moving, people moving, and you know, what happens when those, those things kind of, all those collisions occur. Um, and I think it's right, it's true. It's very, it can be extremely disruptive. But what's interesting is, you know, I mean, what I've been doing in my work for all these years is looking at how contagion sort of shape human behavior and how stamped and scarred we've been you know, from, you know, whether it's our settlement patterns that are changed by malaria or the way we live in cities that was altered by cholera, you know, and the list goes on and on. Um, microbes are always taking advantage of human behavior, right? Um, mm -hmm. But the one behavior that they take advantage of, and, and then we constrain it, and, you know, they, they successfully make us change our behavior because they're exploiting it. So then there's this cost. And so then we change our behavior. Um, but the one behavior that microbes always have to take advantage of is our mobility. You know, a microbe has no independent locomotion of its own. So to cause any kind of an infection, any kind of epidemic or pandemic, it has to have us move it from one place to another. Um, and so there's this huge cost to mobility, which is obviously very clear to us today right now in this moment. But in the broad scope of history, we haven't constrained our mobility at all. You know, I mean, just the opposite, we've moved more, farther, in more complex ways. Um, and not just in modern times, but you know, now we're putting together the much richer history of our migratory past. And it's very com complex and you know, there's this continuous movement that's been going on even in our distant past, even in, our, even in ancient times. And so then you think, well, okay, there's this huge cost to mobility and yet we keep doing it. So in the broader scheme of things, there must be some benefit that's outweighing those heavy costs. And so that's kind of how I came into looking at migration generally is like, 
why do we always think of it as a crisis? Why is that reflexive? Oh, people are moving. It's a, it's a migrant crisis, you know? Uh, or we think this is a problem that might be happening in the future and we don't want it to happen. So then we say, well, if we do that, then there'll be a migrant crisis. There'll be so many migrants. It'll be a catastrophe. You know, we don't think about is there absorptive capacity in the whole society? Is it going to be life-saving for the migrant, him or herself? Is it going to maybe contribute to the resilience of the societies they leave behind? You know, I mean, those are all the questions you would want to ask if you actually wanted to consider, is this migratory flow, you know, a net positive or a net negative? But we, we really don't even ask any of those questions. We very reflexively say, if people are moving, that, you know, that's a problem. And so, so that's sort of what I wanted to, you know, investigate in this book is sort of um, interrogate. Why do, why do we think that way? It's a fascinating subject. And speaking of the cost of um, mobility, I want to, for a second, just share personally the cost of immobility, mm -hmm. having been under the most uh, draconian, longest lockdown in the world, going on 110 days in Morocco, where we were not allowed to be outside of our homes except a once a weekly thing for grocery shopping, medical care, or essential work. I can tell you that. <laughs> at least for me personally, movement has been essential to my mental health. But I wanna talk about your intellectual mobility for a second. This book alone, not to mention your other four, covers subjects from lemmings to Linnaeus, checker spot butterflies to the Syrian war, hottentots to okia trees, and I could go on and on. You have a bachelor's degree in neuroscience, philosophy, and journalism, but I'm really interested uh, for the science geeks among us, um, what has been your path for developing this type of investigative social, giant, social justice oriented science writing? Like, how did you get to where you are now where you're writing about these big picture subjects like oil and pandemics and migration? I'm not really sure, but <laughs> I, I think part of my part of my interest in the topics I take on is political. You know, I mean, I'm I really feel like in the end, the questions I'm trying to answer are about inequality, um, which is something that impressed was impressed upon me at a very young age, being the child of Indian immigrants, and I spent my summers in India. Um, with my family, you know, my extended family there. And I saw up close at a very young age, extreme poverty. It was, you know, it's very up close and personal in places like, you know, Mumbai in the 1970s. And, um, and I never could understand it. You know, why, why do the kids on the street who are begging and living in the dirt next to the cows and the, the traffic have to live their lives out there on the street while I get to live in this nice air conditioned apartment with running water. Um, why did my cousins in India live in a tenement apartment while we lived in a suburban home in Connecticut? You know, all of these things like were very confusing to me as a, as a young person growing up and there's no good answer for it. Of course, like you can ask a, an adult, if a child asks an adult, like, why are some people so poor? I mean, you will not get a good answer, you know? And so that was always very frustrating to me. And I feel like in every step of the way and in my inquiries in different topics, I'm trying to still answer that question. Why do we live in such a lopsided world? You know, why, is, why do some places have great health and some places don't? Why do some places have great prosperity in some places don't? Why do some people have great mobility and other people don't? You know, so the, this sort of lopsidedness, this patchiness of all of our rights and resources is what has always interested me. And science has just been a uh, way into those questions. You know, I mean, health, as you know, as a physician, that health is the end result of all of that coming together. Um, and so writing about infectious diseases became an, a way to talk about uh, differences between peoples and between societies. And, you know, and migration sort of flew, out, flew from there also. Mm. As a curator in the past for TED and TED Med, I'm constantly on the search for the most interesting, germane and overlooked ideas where do your paradigm shifting ideas come from? I get that, that you ask the big why pictures, 
but I'm wondering if you can share the origins of this particular book um, and how you came to the conclusion that, that migration isn't this crisis of invading aliens, but actually a solution or an instinct for I all mean, I, beings. I, it's a great question, Nassim, because I actually started on the other side of this, you know, so this was really a personal journey. I mean, after my pandemic book came out, I mean, it hadn't actually come out, but I had finished writing it. And I, um, it was around 2015. And it was when the quote unquote Mediterranean migrant crisis started. So people mm -hmm. were coming out of Syria and Afghanistan. They're crossing the Mediterranean, trying to make their way up into, you know, Northern Europe. And they're getting stuck in the Mediterranean. And so there was just like the headlines were just full of that story. Um, and, it, and it seemed to me at that time that, okay, here's these populations are moving. They're coming from places where, you know, vaccination programs had probably broken down, failed states. Um, they're under a lot of pressure and they're moving into places that are very, you know, very different disease environment. Um, and then you also have climate change. And so I thought, okay, all of this, all of these collisions are going to lead to outbreaks that this is a disease risk. And so I got a grant from Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting, who has been extremely generous in supporting a lot of my work for many years now, to go to Greece and to report on, you know, what was happening in terms of health status of people on the move, the refugees and asylum seekers who were getting stuck in, in Greece at that time. And I remember I sat down with, um, I think it was, a, it was a doctor from uh, Docs Without Borders who were very active there. And I was like, well, what's, you know, what are, what are some of the disease risks you're afraid of because of this migrant crisis? And he was just like, there is no migrant crisis. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean? You know? And he was like, there is no migrant crisis. It's, it's, it's not a migrant crisis. It's a crisis of welcome. You know, the crisis is because the host societies are trying to repel these people and they're by their, you know, the absence of welcome and hospitality they're making these people sick. You know, that's why there was outbreaks of scabies and chicken pox and, and the rest of it, which I did find. Um, but in fact, migrants are healthier than the host populations they enter, which is, as you know, a well-documented um, health outcome, a differential that we've been documenting for a long time. Well, why is that? Well, migrants, migration itself requires resilience. It requires mobile capital, um, like education skills, resourcefulness, and good health. Um, so, you know, it makes a certain amount of sense, but it's really counterintuitive to our conventional wisdom, which is that, you know, people moving around are, you know, they're disease vectors and they're poorer than us and they're going to, you know, bring all this sort of baggage with them and contaminate our kind of pure landscapes. And, you know, from what he told me, it was exactly the opposite. And then when I did the reporting, in fact, that was true. So that is what kind of like clicked in my mind. It's like, well, why did I conflate migration with crisis you know why did i reflexively think that if people are moving they must be introducing foreign germs and they must be causing problems they must they must be the problem you know so so that was sort of the the little seed that got planted at that time yeah you talk about in the book this healthy migrant effect and in fact we do know from um, public health and medicine that the migrants, they start off uh, with better health and higher than average skills in education and social capital than the places where they're usually coming to, even if they're coming from poor, poorer countries and less resourced countries. I've seen that myself studying the health of nomads in Iran compared to settled populations, that as soon as they are settled, they usually you know, they're living off the land, they're constantly moving, they're leaving infectious diseases behind. And then when they're settled, they typically go to the slums of a city and, and become uh, less healthy. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting way to reframe talking about mm -hmm. refugees, not as a crisis, but really an opportunity. Um, one of the ways, the many ways that your book and its research rocked my thinking was in its orientation to invasive species. Now, I never thought about um, refugees as much in the crisis um, 
category just because I work with refugees and I come from immigrant stock myself, but I completely bought into this environmental or conservationist trend of privileging native plants and even uprooting the foreign ones. And I personally felt really guilty about loving eucalyptus trees, knowing that they belong or thinking that they belong only in Australia. And even though they grow prolifically in places like California and Morocco and other places I love, and here in Seattle, people have been freaking out about this giant hornet or what they call the Japanese or Asian giant hornet that preys on honeybees. In your book, I learned about the Third Reich's bias against all things foreign, including plants, um, and how Heinrich Heimler, the architect of the Holocaust, created these rules banning non-native plants in landscaping Tell us a bit about how your research on migration changes the paradigm for thinking about these invasive species. And what does an indigenous species even mean? I mean, I think that's an excellent question because really, so, so in the way we think about, um, you know, gardening or, you know, landscaping and botany, all, you know, plant life generally is we make this distinction between well, what's native and what's alien or not native. And it is in a way arbitrary in the sense that it depends on your time scale. You know, this idea that certain species belong in certain places, I trace the history of that back to the, you know, the father of modern taxonomy, Carl Linnaeus. And he basically saw you know, he saw nature as an expression of God's perfection. So mm -hmm. when he went around to, and named everything, and he's the one who came up with like our way of classifying all of, you know, the, the natural world. Um, and he named tens of thousands of species. And we still use that structure that he came up with to this day. Um, and he including basically- Including Homo sapiens? Inclu including, including Homo sapiens, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he decided that, well, wherever he found anything, like that's where it belonged because for him, there weren't very many migrations and there was no extinction. There's no, you know, there's no process of change in his thinking about nature. Everything was just perfect, perfectly adapted and perfectly harmonious exactly where it was. And so that's how he decided to classify everything. And then that taxonomy got incorporated into many fields, you know, all of the fields that we use to interrogate nature and to understand nature. And then of course that gets translated into the conventional wisdom and how we think about um, where animals belong, where plants belong. You know, we see it in the animal maps that we give out to our kids and hang on their nursery walls with, you know, the camel, that's mm. for the Middle East and the kangaroos for Australia and the bears for North America. And you know, as if those species are so wedded to that place that they are one in the same. And it really erases any past history of moving around and any future, you know, any future my mobility and migrations they might do. And if you look at just a camel, for example, well, the camel probably evolved in North America. It's probably found in its most abundant forms in parts of South America. There's lots of camels in Australia. In the Middle East, the camels are mostly domesticated. So then you start wondering, well, where do camels belong? You know, mm -hmm. and, and how do you decide that? Here in the United States, we've decided that anything that came after Columbus is not native and everything before that is native. But it's not like things were stationary all the way up until Columbus came and then suddenly started moving. So there's been this sort of history of continuous movements that we've kind of erased. And this whole paradigm of, well, some things are native and some things are not, comes from that thinking that the nature is sedentary unless we move things. Hmm. So, so this idea of invasiveness, um, I don't deny that it's, that there are disruptions. You know, there's certain species that enter into certain ecosystems and they can be incredibly disruptive, especially on isolated places like islands and stuff. Um, so I don't dispute that at all. I think those disruptions are real and we are perfectly entitled to manage our landscapes the way we want to, hmm. right? But it's the, moral, it's the moral value we put on natives writ large, that all natives are good and all non-natives don't fit in and don't belong, that I take issue with. When you look at the actual numbers, about 1% of species that are moved into new places actually are able to thrive in those new places. 
of those that are able to thrive, 1% become disruptive in some way, whether it's to the local species or whether it's to human health or it's to even to our eco economics, right? So sometimes there's something that, like the honeybees, you know, the, the, the hornets that everyone's talking about right now, and they're very pejorative, pejoratively called the murder hornets and things mm -hmm. like that. Um, and we don't call other predators, you know, we don't call lions murder cats um, because we <laughs> accept that, you know, it's okay for animals to prey on other creatures. Like that's part of nature too. Um, and it's, it's okay for an insect to be carnivorous. I, you know, we, I don't see why we have to judge, judge them for that. Um, but, you know, they're, and I, I don't deny that they're going to be disruptive to honeybees, but of course, honeybees are also introduced. Those are, honeybees are from Europe. Um, so when we're talking about it, I think we need to be a lot more nuanced about what we mean. And when we echo the nativist re rhetoric that we've established for people, then I think we're kind of going in the wrong direction because this same idea of kind of painting all immigrants as bad, you know, they, we see this with the Trump administration. They did a, made a big thing about the few crimes that immigrants or asylum seekers seek, they amplify and, and make it sound as if, well, this is representative of the whole class of people, right? So yes, it's true. Some, some asylum seekers commit crimes, some immigrants commit crimes. Does that mean that all immigrants are criminals? No, we don't, you know, we don't, we can understand that clearly that that's, you know, that's an exaggeration. But when it comes to native plants and non-native plants, we kind of do do that. We say, well, all non-native, all alien plants are, are bad. They can't possibly fit in. Um, and I think it's also this idea about ecosystems, right? That this idea that certain species have evolved for eons together. And if you just move it around, then they're not gonna be able to function. And in some cases that might be true. But in other cases, it's not true at all that, that you know, e what ecologists are finding is that species that are bunched together suddenly, they actually can adapt to each other um, and they can live together in harmonious ways. And that's one of the things I reported on in the book is this um, in Hawaii, which is such a interesting place to go uh, to look at this problem of invasions because it is such a remote you know, geographically so remote in the middle of the Pacific, everything there is a migrant to one extent or another. So this, you know, where you cut the line of like, okay, well, if you came before this date, then we'll call you native and you're good. But if you came after this date, then no, we think you're alien, you know, because the arbitrariness of it starts to become clearer in places like that. Your book made me realize there's so much power to, to naming, to being a taxonomist, right? Um, and it, it's almost like uh, originally when the novel coronavirus was named the Wuhan virus, right? Or the Chinese virus, and now we call it SARS coronavirus too. Um, it's made me really think about the naming of other species like one of my favorites, Japanese maple. What do I call it now? <laughs> um, but it also made me think maybe our taxonomy for people is also equally arbitrary. For instance, uh, even though they're not really clear numbers keeping track, and these are probably underestimates, the UN says there are about 70 million people who are on the move, of which there are 26 million refugees, 44 million internally displaced, and then there are economic migrants, there's climate migrants, although that's a controversial term to say climate migrant or refugee, there are gypsies, there are people experiencing homelessness, um, and then even someone like me who self-describes as a global nomad. So um, I wondered, has this made you rethink how we talk about people on the move and, um, and, and is it really just an arbitrary political decision like everything post-Columbus um, being considered um, non-native? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I tried to use, you know, when I first started doing the research for this book, I tried to use the terminology that the experts use to study migration. Right. And the, but it very quickly kind of broke down for me because there's an arbitrariness there too. You know, we look, we, we say certain kinds of migrants, migrations are okay. 
um, you know, asylum seeking if it's for persecution by a state. If it's because of poverty, then no, then you're an economic migrant and maybe we don't want you. Um, you know, we, we kind of, we kind of decide, well, which reasons are okay to move and which reasons are not okay to move. And we don't have an overarching sort of paradigm to understand just people are moving. And what I came to understand is that even asking the question is, is sort of, it's part of, it's, it, it, it kind of reveals and exposes that underlying bias that we think of movement as the strange phenomena that needs explanation. You know, you're going to move, okay, give us your reason and we're going to label you based on that reason. Well, most people migrate for, migrate for many reasons. You know, there isn't just one reason. You know, they, they kind of have to force their complicated story into these little, you know, narratives in order to satisfy a, a border guard or an immigration <laughs> control person or something. And that, you know, and that complicates even work, the work of journalists. Like you go and ask people, well, why did you move? And it's like, how can you explain why? You know, it's, it's so multifaceted. There's no one reason why you can tell a story, you know, but it's, again, there's that arbitrariness to it. And so then I started thinking, well, what, maybe the question we need to ask is not why are people moving, but why are people staying still? You know, if you look at the whole picture of movement in our history and the role of movement in nature, then I think it could be arguably could be as valid to ask why are, why are some of us sedentary some of the time instead of moving, you know? So, so in the end, it became one of those questions of like, well, maybe we shouldn't really, that, maybe that's the wrong question. <laughs> I love that. Just, uh, was it yesterday? I think it was yesterday. The uh, immigration official in Morocco asked me, why are you in Morocco? <laughs> <laughs> and the shortest answer is because I like it. And your, uh, your book actually helped me understand why, the way that um, in childhood, what your environmental exposures are turn on certain genes. And I grew up in Los Angeles with a uh, Iranian heritage. So I'm getting the cultural vibes there. I'm getting the weather vibes there. And there's just something about Seattle, my beloved adopted, native <laughs> or home city that doesn't activate those same genes. I just feel better um, in many ways in, in a place like Morocco, but it does, it always, it always mystifies them. You don't work in Morocco, they say. I say, no, <laughs> I just like it. Um, so anyway, um, tell me about climate migrants um, and the fear around what's going to happen with climate change and um, movement of people. What do, you, what do you predict is going to happen and what do you think should happen? I mean, I think we're already seeing that climate patterns are starting to get scrambled. I mean, migration patterns are starting to get scrambled because of the climate crisis. Mm -hmm. We know that around 80% of species have shifted their ranges because of in sync with the changing climate. So they've moved north, they've moved up into the mountains. Um, even things that we don't think of as particularly mobile, like coral polyps that build coral reefs are moving. They've tracked coral polyps around Japan moving north uh, since the 1930s. Forests are moving up the, you know, in the Himalayas, they're moving up into the higher reaches of the mountains. <clears throat> so we see in nature, things are, are starting to move in sync with the changing climate. And I think we can expect that that is also going to be happening with human settlement. I mean, all of our settlement patterns have been shaped by a certain climate that we had uh, during the time of, you know, shipping commerce and everything. So we live along rivers, we live by ports, we live next to the shore, um, and those places are changing. And so people are going to have to move. I think, unfortunately, we have turned, manufactured that into a kind of crisis narrative. Hmm. We've decided that, um, you know, we have this picture of, mig of climate migration, that it's all going to happen all at once, and there's going to be this flood or this tsunami of people, you know, rushing inland or rushing to higher ground from these exposed parts of the world. 
what we're actually seeing is a much more subtle and complex form of movement. You know, people get clues from the local environment that they then incorporate in their decisions about where to live and whether to move. And sometimes it's a signal like the first dry spell that precedes a drought. You know, the first couple years of decreased yields in your farm, which precedes mm. your farm sort of going under because of sea level rise, for example. Um, you see those subtle signals are already starting and people are responding to that. And so migration experts have been able to track some of those linkages like, OK, well, this happened. And so, you know, people are starting to move. But it's all it's all mediated through our politics. Right. So you look at the Syrian civil war, for example, which is like a kind of a famous example of potentially a climate based migration that there was a drought in the rural hinterlands of Syria mm -hmm. for many years. And so a lot of rural people ended up coming into the city. And then in the city, they were kind of, you know, marginalized and, you know, crowded together. Um, the regime was not good about making sure that food prices didn't go haywire. So there was this crisis happening because of all these new people and this failure of the political regime to deal with it. And then the unrest was then met with this heavy hand, which then of course triggered the civil war and these huge, huge movements of people which we've been seeing unfold before our eyes over the last five years. So did the drought cause the Syrians migration outside of Syria or was it the regime's failure to incorporate properly newcomers into the main cities? Or was it the failure of you know, the agricultural market to maintain prices that people could afford? Or you know, there's all these other ways in which one change could have altered the path that people took, you know, that maybe they would have stayed, maybe they would have left, maybe they go somewhere else. So you can't really, it's, it's, it gets down to that same thing again. We want to have this reductionist narrative of, right. okay, this happens and then they move, you know, because we want to see it as simple and as something that we can control. But I think it's just the opposite of that. It's, it's complex, it's dynamic, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, dialectical, you know, it's in, in reaction mm -hmm. to other forces that, you know, are, are syncing up and changing and influencing each other in different ways. So this desire that we have is what we need to maybe deal with is why do we want to reduce it into this simplistic model where one unit of climate change equals one unit of migration? You know, that's not how it's happening and that's not how it is going to unfold. I must admit that before reading your book, I too was one of those people who was overestimating the dangers of movement with climate. And so your book actually gave me solace. I want to uh, switch the topic to another one of these zeitgeist issues that your book brings up, which is our reckoning with racism. Can you talk about how some of the scientists you feature in the book um, are actually making the case for Black people being alien and less than human in the same way that we talk about other invasive species and plants and animals and how this is linked to the origins of eugenics and race-based medicine. Yeah, so I mean, ultimately, the more we erase migration and the history of migration, we're erasing our connections to each other. And so I think that's kind of the underlying problem we're seeing right now in our politics, right? Like we think of people as very different from each other when we actually have this shared humanity. Mm. Um, and I trace it back to Linnaeus again, where he said, you know, when he did his taxonomy of humans, he called us homo sapiens as if we were wise, um, but he also split us up into subspecies. So he decided people were so different from each other that those who lived on different continents were actually biologically alien from each other, that we were separate subspecies. And in fact, gave us separate, you know, Latin names in his taxonomic and nomenclature. Um, and he also said that, and this was a common conventional wisdom at the time, that people who lived in Africa were subhuman, that he actually had an origin story for African people, that they were not fully homo sapiens, but a cross between homo sapiens and what he called troglodytes, which were 
you know, we, they don't exist, but he thought they did. He thought they were a, a subhuman, uh, different species, which it consisted of like people with albinism, people with gigantism, you know, di different kinds of pathological conditions that we understand now. But he thought they were all some other kind of monstrous species, monst like kind of monster humans, and that Africans were descendants of a, a hybrid, you know, a hybrid offspring of a real human and a monster human. And, you know, that was the kind of thinking that underlie things like bringing African women into Europe and putting them on display, um, which, you know, we know the story of the Hottentot Venus, which was a woman from Cape Town, South Africa, who was brought up into Europe and was displayed in all the fancy mm -hmm. salons and museums of Europe for many years. She was a 25 year old uh, woman and for an extra fee, you could prod her behind. People were looking at her like she's not a real, she's not fully human, she's something else her her she was dissected um and her body parts were kept in a museum in paris mm -hmm. up through the 1970s that was sitting there um mm -hmm. it was displayed at the world fair people went they did a they made a stuffed they stuffed her body and put it on display at the world fair and people would look at it as if she had some non-human body when she had a she had a body just like ours she she was one of us um and so you see that thinking, you know, come down into race science. So then scientists thought, okay, if there are all these subspecies, then we need to study them the way we study, you know, lepidopterists study frogs, like race scientists study race and all these different racial groups and what will happen, the biological catastrophe that might happen if they start to mix together. So there's all these fears about miscegenation that if we let immigrants in, if we let the you know, enslaved Africans just live wherever they wanted, that they would start to mix together and that that would be sort of catastrophic. It would be like, you know, horses and donkeys or something, you know, that there you'd have these sort of sterile offspring that were kind of diminished in some way, that it would lead to this kind of degeneration. And that was a big topic in, in, in scientific circles in the 20th century. Um, including in eugenic circles. And those are the people who basically came up with our 1920s immigration laws that put in racial quotas in the United States and said, well, you know, and, and nobody from Africa, nobody from Asia, because those people were literally considered biologically inferior. And that if they were allowed to come into the country that they would contaminate the nation with their inferior germplasm, that's what they called it. Um, and those ideas were directly you know, directly influenced Hitler and the Nazi regime. And then of course he put it into place in a much more elaborate fashion and in a genocide that we all know about, of course. Mm -hmm. um, but those ideas never really died. You know, they, they were, because we didn't have any reckoning with the underlying ideas. We never had a reckoning with all of those scientific ideas. We turned the, the Linnaean subspecies theory into our modern ideas about race. You know, and we still use those, even though scientists have shown again and again, there are more differences between two individuals of the same race than there are between one individual from one race and another individual from another race. So our diversity is, it's a tapestry. It's, it's you know, it's a, it's a, continu it's a continuous thing, um, but we've broken it up into these disconnected pieces in this arbitrary way again, and diminished some of some of those peoples, which we see today. I mean, you look at that George mm -hmm. Floyd video, and it just went through my mind when I was watching it that he doesn't think of that person under his knee as a fully human being like himself, you know? So that idea of these, these people are separate. Um, I think it has this long history, and it's and it's been made possible in part by erasing the connections between us, erasing the history of migration. That means that yes, we dif differentiate in certain places when we live there for some amount of time because we're very fungible, we're very adaptable to the environments we live in. So we do di differentiate, but then we bring that differentiation, that novelty into new societies and, that's, and then that's assimilated into them. So we have this sort of dynamic process that's ongoing. And, by, by, you know, 
ignoring all of that and pretending otherwise, then we're able to have what we have today, which is this idea of a racial hierarchy and this idea that there are actual, you know, maybe biological differences between race. I mean, amazingly, medicine still uses race it as does. a concept in, you know, in medical questionnaires and studies and in even in therapeutics, as you know. Um, so this is a very pernicious idea that has deep roots. Yeah, race was created for racist reasons. Um, and it's amazing how many non-science-based narratives are haunting us to this day. I want to close by asking you, the one who's restless and constantly on the move, about your idea of home. Um, for me, as a bicultural person, I've always had this ambivalence about calling either of my two countries my homeland. Um, and in fact, it hasn't been until the pandemic where my mobility was so restricted that I felt homesick for the first time. I'm wondering if you would read for us um, how you reckon with home, um, if you would read the passage toward the end of the book where you're working with Eritrean refugees. Yeah, absolutely. This is the part that starts on page 310, right, Nassim? Yes. yes, okay. I met Sophia and Mariam a couple years ago in a cramped second floor apartment in a rundown neighborhood in East Baltimore where a local NGO had placed the two women together with their children. As a newly christened volunteer for the local refugee agency, I'd been handed a pile of folders about each refugee family in need of help. Instructed to pick one, I'd chosen them. We talked through a local translator patched in through a cell phone. Mariam, who had fled Eritrea on foot, made it to a refugee camp just over the border in Ethiopia. Freed from the persecution of Eritrea's military regime, she spent most of her time hanging around, somewhat aimlessly. She is lithe, playful, and quick to smile but living in a refugee camp had excluded her from the productive activities of society. She did not go to school. She did not have a job. Her main memory of her time in the camp when I ask her is of playing pickup games of soccer. Sophia's track out of Eritrea curled toward the north. From Sudan, she made her way to Cairo where she scraped by along the margins. The small cross she wore dangling on a chain around her neck marked her as an outsider, excluding her from mainstream Egyptian society. She took a job cleaning hotel rooms, but the heavy lifting damaged her back and the botched surgery that followed left her incapacitated and unable to work. In yet another stroke of bad luck, doctors diagnosed her little boy fathered by a fellow Eritrean on the run whom she'd met in Cairo with a cancerous tumor in his left kidney. But Miriam and Sophia had a path to a more secure future. Through the local offices of the United Nations Refugee Agency, Eritreans in Cairo and in refugee camps could apply for refugee status. The agency would scan their faces and collect their fingerprints and biographical data. If, if the officers found them acceptable, they might refer their cases to some other country which after conducting its own investigation into their backgrounds and biographies might find them suitably harmless and deserving. They might be allowed to move to a place where they could start making a home and a life for themselves. Every year, the agency resettles around 100,000 of the nearly 26 million refugees it recognizes. Mariam and Sophia both applied. They waited for nearly a decade before they were granted refugee status. The UN agency accepted their applications and referred their cases to officers of the US Refugee Resettlement Program, which decided where they would, from then on, be allowed to live. Separately, they collected their belongings and boarded planes that would deposit them in their new homes. They wanted to find jobs, they said. They wanted their children to be educated. Sophia's son, a tall, watchful boy, leaned on his mother's knee, his eyes wide and his expression serious. Miriam's daughter took an opposite tack, screwing her face into exaggerated expressions, touching my things and climbing up onto my lap in the successful effort to charm. Mm. 
As we sat together on the carpeted floor and pondered their prospects, Marion brought out from their <clears throat> Marion brought out from their little galley kitchen plates of glistening strawberries, thinly sliced apples, and sliced oranges. The kids gathered hungrily around a platter of injera, the Eritrean sour sourdough flatbread, with steaming spiced lentils and curried potatoes mounded atop it. Miriam and Sophia knew only a few words of broken English. They had no job skills to speak of. They were refugees in a society whose leaders called refugees animals, pests, and worse. And they were black women in a city so plagued by poverty and so ordered by race that living in one of its poor black neighborhoods curtails life expectancy by three decades. They had to care for two toddlers. They didn't know how to drive. Who would hire them? How would they manage to get to work if anyone did? They had little family around to call on for support. The fathers of their children lived thousands of miles away. Mariam's partner had been resettled in Germany, Sophia's in Sweden. A framed photograph of a young woman was propped up on a small shelf. It was Sophia's daughter who lived in Eritrea. She'd been a toddler when Sophia left. Now she was a teenager. Sophia hadn't seen her in years. Borders had cut through her family like a freeway through a forest, scattering broken pieces across the continents. One recent evening in December, I picked them up to go see the Christmas lights in downtown Baltimore. After parking the car, we had to walk a, flu we had to walk a few blocks in below freezing weather, during which they described to me how in Eritrea they celebrated Christmas with a special meal at church and a round of visits to neighbors. Then the scene of electrified American excess that I'd brought them to see came into view. On this particular city block, lo locals had looped strings of twinkling lights from their windows, porches, and roofs in between their row houses and across the narrow street to the row houses facing theirs. They'd crammed their small front yards with giant electrified candy canes plastic snowmen waving their chubby arms and piles of shiny gift-wrapped packages under sculptural Christmas trees built out of beer cans and old hubcaps. A woman dressed as Santa Claus handed out cookies to the crowd gathered to ogle the spectacle. At the end of the street, couples holding snowsuit clad babies on their hips lined up to snap photos of themselves, standing next to a man wearing a felted reindeer costume. In the car, as we drove back to their apartment, the women were quiet. Is nice, Sophia finally said, nodding. American Christmas. I didn't know what to say. The candied red and white extravaganza challenged my own fledgling sense of cultural competency. I couldn't imagine that it made any sense to her. It hardly made any sense to me. I turned up the heat. Miriam's toes were numb because she had not worn any socks under her thin black sneakers. We drove in silence until we reached their neighborhood a few miles away. Months would pass before they found work, Miriam taking a night job at an industrial laundromat, Sophia cleaning a cafeteria. As I turned into the driveway, their building emerged out of the shadows. Despite the strangeness of the night, the uncertainty of her future, the precariousness of the journey that had brought her to this unlikely destination, Sophia looked up at the sight of her building as if it were unexpected and whispered softly to herself, my home. That was beautiful, thank you. Um, we have some questions from the audience. I'm sorry we're running out of time. This has gone by so fast. The first question is from Saul and he's wondering, what we know about the speed of migration, whether in plants or the manatees or the butterflies or refugees, and how is there a consistent story we can tell about um, how the speed of migration is related to its disruptive potential? Yeah, I think that's a that's a great question. I think that's really the the point that we need to focus in on is pace. I think the pace is what can be overwhelming, can overwhelm the absorptive capacity of whatever society or ecosystem is you know, taking on newcomers. 
Um, and so the pace is something we can manage. You know, if we think of migration as an ongoing reality, as not a crisis, but part of the solution to the problems that we face, then we can manage these things so that we can minimize the disruptions and maximize the benefits. And I think looking at the pace of arrivals and change is one way to do it. Um, if we knew that you know, these certain parts of the world are, are becoming uninhabitable, we could start building legal pathways for people to move before it becomes a crisis. You know, we can moderate the pace of migration that way. We can work on the resilience of ecosystems and societies that are vulnerable to people moving to also moderate the pace so people can stay in place for longer and leave later or, or at a different speed. And I think that's the kind of thinking that we need to move towards. But to do that, we have to first accept that migration is going to happen, that we should, we're not going to be able to say, no, you know, root out all of the alien plants from your mm -hmm. landscape and close the borders and pull up the ladders and don't let anybody in. We need to go back to this state, this, you know, fantasy of stationary sedentariness, this, you know, complete manufactured idea of a past when everything was still. I think we have to move beyond that to get to, you know, a, a place where we can actually have some of the more nuanced conversations about how do we manage migration? Because I think that's, that's where we need to be. Uh, you make the point that we shouldn't be called homo sapien, but um, homo migratio or homo migratio, <laughs> because movement is so inherent to who we are as a species and perhaps all living species. We have a second question a little bit related to this from Leslie, who asks, if, if race is this fallacious construct, the way, let's say, an alien species is, and it's not science-based, do you see a world in which um, we can aim for um, a different way of talking about people, a race neutrality, the way now we're talking about gender neutrality? I what would so. get us to change that? What would get us to change these deeply held narratives that are actually not factual? That I'm not. I'm. What would take to get us from here, from this place we're at, to like this, you know, more transcendent understanding? I'm. That is not clear to me. If I knew, you know, that's sort of the hundred million dollar question. How do we get there? I don't know. But I know where we could go. I can imagine that place. You know, in the past, before. Um, you know, the Enlightenment period and in ancient and medieval times, there's good evidence that people didn't think of skin color as a very meaningful marker mm -hmm. of, of human difference. You know, they, they noticed it, they put it in their art, but it didn't order their lives. It didn't order their society. It was sort of like uh, spots on a dog or the color of your hair. It, it's, it's noticeable, but it's not a socially meaningful fact. Um, and I, so you can imagine that we can live that way. Right, so we can understand that we're we have morphological diversity, we have cultural diversity, we have this range of diversity among us, but we don't need to draw lines between us and say, well, let's categorize, put all these people in one group and put all these people in the other group, and that that is very arbitrary and really negates the similarities we have. So I can uh, you can imagine that we can get to that place. Um, the problem is that we have used this fake idea about our biological differences to create social contract constructs and build whole societal systems on it you know so our whole social structure here in the united states our economy everything is based on race so deeply embedded in our economic and and our social structures and so we really need to get you know kind of wipe the slate clean to start over if we want to get to a place where we're not using race anymore in our in our social systems but you can imagine that that is possible, right? Because you can imagine that a racial difference, skin color differences, that these are just things that, you know, I mean, I think it orders the way we think to such an extent that we don't even notice that it, you know, the people who live in Ghana and people who live in South Africa and people who are, you know, have African ancestry and live in Detroit or Baltimore, we say that they're all the same race. Like they have, they have something in special in common with each other, um, they they maybe they do, but they don't not in any obvious way, and they don't have anything special in common with each other that we don't have with each other across those differences. So we kind of close our minds to all of the outlying facts that 
interrupt the racial idea and make you know make it nonsensical because really when you look at the particulars it doesn't make a lot of sense it doesn't really hold together um and yet we continue to use it by kind of not seeing all the all the you know disruptive facts that don't make sense in our category system it's all about the narratives <laughs> we tell uh, ourselves and each other and um, the way we organize our society speaking of narratives What's your next narrative uh, development or direction if you're, if you're in that space to share? I am still waiting to see how, you know, the, my process has been to let the books out into the world and sort of get a sense of how they're being accepted and how they're being read. And I think the next book kind of comes out of that. The last book I wrote on pandemics, a lot of people read that as you know, they would read it and they would say, oh my God, now I'm terrified that you've made me so scared and all these germs are out there and gonna encroach upon us and invade us. And like, I'm just gonna stay in my closet from now on. And that's not what I was trying to get at. But that, and so I really used that response to my last work, it really shaped this one, you know, cause this is, this is something I wanted to add to the conversation that we don't have to think of ourselves as passive you know, passive victims of invasions of foreigners that, you know, there's a, there's a whole other way of looking at our, our history and, and of nature. So I'm waiting to see. Well, unfortunately we're out of time, but thank you so much, Sonia. I could talk to you all day. Thank you for your luminous work. And I really look forward to your next book. And thank you also to the Boston Public Library for hosting us. Thank you, Nassim. This is so much fun. Thank you to the library. This Boston Public Library is one of my favorite libraries. So this is a really such a thrill to be able to do this with you guys. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, Nassim. Love the Boston connection. Love the fascinating conversation that you just led us on that journey. Very thought provoking. Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon and have a wonderful day. Take care. Thanks. Bye.